the first thing that happened in Norway was that trans activists lobbied for the removal of transvestic fetishism to belong in the diagnostic classification of a fetish. So that was the first thing that happened. That happened in 2009. And all of a sudden, transvestic fetishism wasn't a fetish anymore. That brought on a wave of men claiming to be women. And they also brought with it this new uh, vocabulary of trans persons. And then this concept, gendered identity. It started flooding the mainstream media and then it started flooding like legislation and politicians. Once that was done, in 2013, uh, the concept of gender identity was then included in Norwegian discrimination law. And then the discrimination law then went from being protecting like specific characteristics and it became this kind of catch-all thing where women's rights and, and sex-based discrimination law was sort of sort of lumped together with all the other characteristics, race, sexual orientation, and then this new gendered identity. And this decision was made without any assessments to how it would impact women and girls. The next step that happened was that in 2015, the Norwegian tax department cited the supposed rights and needs of, and I quote here, transvestite in their decision to remove biological sex as an identity marker. This decision was also made without any assessments to how the removal of biological sex as an identity marker would affect women, even though it is women who almost exclusively is affected by such a decision. But the needs of transvestite, which is of course still a term referring to men with a fetish, you know, regardless of the diagnostic classification, their rights, their needs, needs were assessed in several paragraphs and now it's decided that Norway will introduce gender neutral identification numbers by 2032 where biological sex will be completely removed as an identity marker and this is all in line with um, the yoga carta principles which uh, very clearly states that, that this is the goal then in 2016 Norway implemented a law that made it technically impossible to differentiate between biological sex and the concept of gender identity. The purpose of the law was to remove the criteria of having a diagnosis in order to change legal sex. The campaign was waged using the techniques described in the now notorious Denton's Manual by attaching the proposal to a more popular reform uh, to give it a protective veil, avoiding media attention and by targeting youth politicians in order to have them present the necessary argument to the different political parties. And I'm quoting here because this is what it says in that manual. By having the, the youth political parties present the necessary changes to the political parties. Uh, it would give the impression that the proposal came from within the party rather from an external political lobby organization. And of course, they also lied, straight up lied. They spun this narrative that it was a condition on changing legal sex that the person applying for the legal uh, change had undergone so-called uh, sex reassignment. But this was never the case. Uh, so they outright lied and said that the current legal uh, legislations required the sterilization of trans persons uh, in order for them to be recognized for who they really are, which uh, was not true because uh, so-called sex reassignment was never a condition in order to change legal sex in Norway. The only condition there was, was to have a medical diagnosis. So by now, in 2013, within then seven years, they had removed uh, fetishism, you know, transvestic fetishism as a fetishistic diagnosis, you know, a diagnosis of, of fetishism. And then they now removed the criteria to have a medical diagnosis in order to change or to apply to change legal sex. So the campaign succeeded uh, above all expectations. Uh, nor in Norway, anyone now can change their legal sex, regardless of age, actually. But from the age of six years and older, you don't need a medical diagnosis. Children between the ages of six and 16 can change their legal sex with only one consenting parent, but they can also change their legal sex without any parental consent. They've opened up a loophole for children, essentially, to do that without parental consent. It's also possible for a married spouse to change their legal sex without even informing their partner. 
partner. There's no criteria. You know, the, the, the spouse doesn't have any rights in terms of, you know, leaving their marriage if they want to. So uh, Norway have the most liberal and the most radical laws regarding self-ID. There is no system in place for tracking the number of people who change their legal sex. And it's in technically impossible to check if a person has changed legal sex based on the new identification number. So in Norway, when you change your legal sex, it's actually processed by the tax department. Your identification number in Norway includes data, at least now it does, it includes data on sex and age. Female is denoted by an even number and male is denoted by an odd number. So basically, when you change your legal sex in Norway, you're given a new identification number and there are no sort of technical way of checking if a person has changed, you know, has gotten a new identification number. And it's also impossible to confirm whether or not the variable sex is referring to sex or if it's referring to this concept gendered identity. The law in 2016 was also passed without any assessments on the impact it would have on women's rights. The year following the implementation of self-ID, the number of women reported for rape more than tripled. But the change in the definition of the variable, variable sex was never addressed. And it's also technically impossible to uh, accurately verify the sex of these women. And then, so following this, this was in 2016. And so we've already seen like this repetitively and systematically women's concerns, like just even thinking about women and their existing rights and the impact these massive changes to the variable sex will be having for women. It's not considered once. They've considered transvestites, but they never considered women. So then in 2020, the concept of gender identity was proposed to be included in Norwegian criminal law, and in particularly into the hate crime laws. And by now, I've been made aware of trans activism. So this is 20, well, autumn 2019. And by now, I've been made aware of trans activism and the intensely misogynist and homophobic nature of both their demands and their tactics. And I've also been made aware of the growing movement of women who are voicing their protests and who demand that this erasure of women's sex-based rights needs to stop. So I went to that hearing on behalf of Women's Declaration Norway and then I told them that if they passed this law it was guaranteed that women would start being reported to the police for hate crime simply for having an objective understanding of biological sex because, as we all know, biological sex has been declared hateful and a colonial bias. Nonetheless, the law came into effect in 2021. I was informed by police in May of this year that I was under police investigation suspected for hate speech. So the alleged hate speech includes every single interaction I've had since the law came into effect that I've had with an employee at the leading LGBTQ lobby organization in Norway. This employee is a man who claims to be a lesbian mother and his job is to be an advisor on gender and sexuality. So he reported every interaction we'd had for an entire year since the law came into effect. And then when police opened investigation, he also included a TV debate that we had. So I'm still waiting to hear from the police uh, on what they're going to do uh, or whether or not I will be charged with a crime for stating facts like men cannot be lesbian, they cannot be lesbian mothers. It's very ironic that I am under police investigation for stating things like that because if he is right and he really is a woman and a lesbian mother, then he would be excluded from the paragraph that he is currently being protected within. Because that law that's being en enacted against me now excludes women. So I think that's ironic. I think that's one of the biggest proofs that this man is in fact a man, because if he was a woman, he wouldn't have protection in it. And then it's ironic because if he is what I say he is, which is a man who claims to be a woman, he would in fact be protected by the paragraph. But then, of course, I would be right. And so is that the purpose of this law? To make uh, reality criminal? That's uh, essentially what I've been, uh, yeah, I just wanted to summarize. This is like the progression of how these laws were introduced in Norway.